actually uh, a few years ago um, with uh, Industry 4.0. Uh, nowadays, we call it more digital supply chain in the meantime. Um, and PwC runs every year a survey. Uh, it's a, a big survey. You can see the numbers here on the, on the slide. Uh, and we run that with several uh, industries to probe for, um, to, to know to what extent companies have adopted, are adopting digital aspects into their supply chain. And so this is a big survey that we run every year. Uh, and throughout the next slides, we will come back to, to some of the, the findings that we have seen there. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, there is an important uh, call out here. Uh, tomorrow, supply chains will be connected and self-orchestrated. Connected and self-orchestrated, so two big words, I think. Uh, uh, it means that uh, you should collect data from your end-to-end -end supply chain and do something smart with that data in such a way that uh, it becomes a self-steering supply chain, more or less hands-free supply chain. And it, it's a bit sounds, sounds uh, science fiction maybe, um, but we also know that for certain links in the supply chain, it actually already uh, starts to pop up. Eh? We see some proof of concepts and some pilots being uh, deployed as we speak, uh, which are using indeed artificial intelligence to make decisions to take actions itself. Right? It's still small scale, but it's certainly coming. Um, if we then go to the next slide, we, we also want to know why are companies adopting digital uh, aspects in their supply chain. Right? There, there probably must be a benefit. And what we see uh, from the survey, what potential benefits include. And we see that the, the digital champions, which is the top 10% of the population, uh, that they really have a stronger performance when we look at inventory returns, but also have a stronger performance when we look at on time in full. Yeah? So we, there are really some benefits associated with adopting digital aspects into your supply chain. Uh, so that's the reason why companies are, uh, are looking in this direction. Um, if we then look at the capabilities that are required to uh, set up digital supply chain, and there are two important ones. The first one is supply chain transparency. Um, and supply chain transparency is about knowing what is happening uh, in your end supply chain. Um, and we see that on the next slide, it's about knowing what's uh, happening at your uh, suppliers and at your customer, but also what's happening at the supplier of your suppliers and the customer of your customer. It does not mean that you need to know that every second of the day, and that's not, uh, that's not necessary. Yeah? I, I know a case, where uh, a company is tracking it every 15 minutes, which is already aggressive. Uh, but that's not necessarily because of the transparency on the shipment. It's more about product quality and security. Yeah, so there's, there's a different driver behind that. But at least what, what you should strive for is to, to have transparency on the milestones that are uh, happening throughout the end-to-end -end chain. And there's typically a calendar associated to the milestones, and that's something that should be monitored next to, of course, external events that might impact uh, the process. So that's more as a, the minimum that should be that should be monitored in order to gain uh, transparency in the supply chain. Now, how do you get um, transparency? And on the next slide, eh, we see that that uh, you can get that with uh, technology, of course. Um, uh, you are collecting data uh, via typical something Internet of Things, uh, data logger, for instance. You are collecting data, a lot of data, of course, and that data must be stored and processed on a, on a smart platform. And, and Chris will uh, later on uh, in this webinar um, present how such a platform can apply. Um, what we see, uh, referring back to the, the survey that we did, um, is that digital champions are already widely adopting this technology. And if we compare that to the, the others in the population, digital champions are really uh, uh, have moved forward in this direction. Uh, the next important key capability um, is uh, related to smart logistics. Um, and on the next slide, eh, we see a, a picture where, we, where you can see um, that uh, smart logistics is all about integrating order to delivery. 
and if you go to the next slide, Marie. Um, so it, it's about integrating this process. Um, and, and that's also what some companies are already doing today. And this is not, uh, not science fiction anymore. If you look at a company like Amazon, you, you put an order on Amazon, uh, the system automatically allocates that order to a distribution center, a fulfillment center, based on, on where you are yourself, but also based on the availability in the network. Um, after that allocation, it automatically triggers uh, a picking instruction on the, on the floor. Uh, it also triggers automatically an instruction to the transport provider, um, and it triggers an invoice. And that's all happening hands-free as we speak today. Right? And it's not only Amazon, also other companies have already uh, implemented this, uh, this way of working. Um, so this more as an introduction. Um, it, it's all about uh, connectivity, transparency, and so on. Um, before we go now uh, in, in depth into the concept of control towers, which Marie will bring, uh, a, a small uh, poll with the audience here. Um, so um, there are different uh, stages in maturity when you talk about uh, digital uh, supply chain. It can be uh, left to right, a digital novice over a vertical integrator to a horizontal integrator to a digital champion. And a novice um, is very much more still a silo-based uh, organization. A vertical integrator is, some, is a company that uh, is integrated within the four walls of the company. A horizontal integrator is a company that has integrated with suppliers and customers already. And the digital champion is really taking it to the next level and creating also disruptive business models. That's, uh, these are the four stages of maturity. And the question is now, where do you see yourself as your company uh, in which uh, stage of maturity would you position yourself? Yes, uh, in the meanwhile, I have launched a poll. So I see that already nine participants answered. So I wait a little bit and then I will, will show the results of the poll and then we go deeper into that. So at the moment, 11 uh, participants have answered. So if you still want to answer, now is the time because I will end the poll. Okay. And I will share the results. So what you can see, uh, I, I hope everybody can see the results at this moment. So what we see is that we have a mixed audience here. <laughs> uh, one third is still working in, in, in silos. Uh, one has some internal integration and uh, some are a little bit more advanced, but we, no one of the participants is uh, very advanced so uh, that they have a fully end-to-end -end integration. So is that in line with the experience that you have at the, P, at the clients of PwC? More or less, when we looked at the, the survey results, eh, we had uh, a bit under 10% uh, in, the, in the first category, in silos. And then we had indeed something like these numbers, nearly 40% and 40% in uh, level two and three. Uh, but we also had, I think, something like 8% in, as digital champions already. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's a bit different, but not that far away either. Yeah. Okay, and then I think I will give the floor now to Marie. Yes, thank you. I still see the poll. I will, I will close the poll. Yes. All right, so this is in fact our understanding of the, uh, let's say of a control tower or just logis logistics control tower. Uh, so in the bottom, in fact, you see the traditional uh, different functionalities that you can find in your supply chain it goes from planning, sourcing, manufacturing, warehousing and distribution. And what we know is that in fact, a lot of our clients or partially they are still working, let's say, uh, independently in separate systems, separate tools, uh, different functions. Uh, and in fact, the goal is to build or to break those um, uh, those disconnections and to build a 360 degrees data network internally, but also externally. 
Once you have your data network, there are different, let's say, tools and applications, which already look uh, quickly touched on, like transparency tool, uh, advanced data analytics tool, and then the integrated planning and execution and the workforce collaboration, who can in fact leverage from your data network that you have built internally and externally. And that will in fact unleash in the end advanced or let's say added uh, value adding capabilities completely from customer interaction through integrated planning and also more flexible yeah, manufacturing or collaboration with your uh, with your end to end network. The focus of today and also of Streamliner is to focus on that integrated planning and execution and also how you can enforce your work for your workforce collaboration um yeah between the different functions but also with the external parties um if we look at how a normal or let's say the main supply chains are built we see that mainly they are built out of three different layers it can also be other types of layers but this is let's say the common example of a supply chain and how it is let's say a control tower and how it is built so the first layer is in fact your visibility layer. So with your, um, with your data, with the integration of the data, uh, you will understand what is in fact happening at this moment in your supply chain. So it is more, let's say, a descriptive kind of data. So you will have dashboards and of course, could be that your control tower can also set up certain alerts if things are, let's say, going outside business rules or if there are certain trends that are identified. Next to that, we will have the, uh, the second level, which is the uh, analytical level, where in fact you can perform advanced analytics on the data that you have gathered. Um, with that, you can try or you will try to understand why is this happening, what could happen next, and how could we even improve that? So in fact, you go from a more descriptive visibility to also maybe a predictive uh, visibility on your data and what is exactly happening in the supply chain. And then we have the third level, which is then in fact taking corrective actions on what is happening. Um, and there's in fact a process execution. So what we now see currently is that still this layer is done with a lot of human um, intervention, but also with, let's say, the, the, yeah, the development of machine learning. It could be that this layer in a few years or in the future will be, let's say, taken um, um, autonomous uh, by the logistics control tower. So this is, in fact, the three different layers, how you should set it up, and let's say, what are the different types of analytics and visibilities that you have. Now with that we explained a little bit what exactly is a control tower and what kind of capabilities it can unleash. Um, we are also would like to understand from the audience because in fact um, we um, are uh, in favor of a design thinking approach, meaning that you should not, let's say, focus on the technology, but you should maybe mainly focus on what are, let's say, the current pain points within your company or what are, let's say, the weak spots? So don't think of a control tower is now hot, so we need it. No, first think of what might be a use case that is applicable to your company or to your business. Okay, thank you, Marie. I've launched the poll already. Uh, so we see people answering. We give them some time, wait a little bit. By the way, uh, I haven't seen any questions in the chat yet, but if you have questions, please type them in the chat and we will come back to these questions. So I see that 12 people have answered the poll. So I think I will close the poll, 30 now. This is your last chance. Okay, I end the poll and I will uh, share the results. So, yeah, Marie, you can have a look at it and maybe mm -hmm. comment on this, but it's uh, again very mixed, as you can see. Uh, okay. 
you know, it's mainly yeah, the order, yeah, traceability, which uh, let's say in the next slide, we will also give you, let's say, the top uh, use cases that we see at our clients and order traceability is definitely one of them. Um, tracking the location and even the condition of your products is, um, is a very important use case for the control tower. So we can, uh, I can continue. Yeah, I still see the poll. Okay. Voilà. So here are examples of use cases that we definitely see as, let's say, the most um, important or uh, yeah, with our clients. So first of all, it was in fact the inventory and more planning, uh, especially with, let's say, the late, like the last times lately that we have a lot of disruptions that companies would like to understand better where is my inventory located? And with that location, can I meet the service levels of my clients uh, or my customers? So also there, it's really to, um, to monitor the demand and the supply from both sides. And there, in fact, maybe do some better inventory allocation um, and reduce stockouts or a lot of inventory turns, et cetera. So that is already an important use case. Next to that, indeed, the order traceability. So as I already mentioned, a lot of companies would like to understand where exactly is my order and even uh, what is the condition of my order. If you work, for example, with uh, cold chain products, uh, indeed, and that can also be facilitated with, let's say, real-time monitors. So that is also uh, a big of interest now lately, especially within, let's say, the pharma companies. And then also a very important one is, in fact, the collaboration um, upstream, but also downstream. So there in the end, so with a better orchestration with your suppliers and even, let's say, visibility with your customers, you would like to um, you would like to reduce costs, meaning that you would not or that you try to avoid critical moves, critical orders, critical shipments, because there is a better end-to-end -end collaboration and orchestration um, of your yeah, upstream and downstream um, flow. So they're working together that can, as I mentioned, also reduce costs. But also there you can go one step further and even think together to innovation of your products, but also innovation of your processes. How can you do things better within your network um, compared to the competitors? Um, its control tower, of course, has like a KPI library, which is always uh, very uh, useful eh, for, uh, for people that they can track the different uh, logistics metrics. And of course, everything comes with a value. Uh, there are a lot of value drivers there. So it's important that uh, with each use case that you take a look at the different impacts on your quantitative values. So normally everything should have somehow a cost saving, cost reduction, or even a revenue benefit. So um, I will not go through all of them. But the point is that there are a lot of, let's say, value drivers that you can keep an eye on or that can even uh, improve the overall business. Now that we talked about the different use cases, uh, this is in fact more to cover on what are, let's say, next to the technology, because we talked a lot about the control towers and what are the technology and now your whole data environment. But next to that, there are also important elements for a company before even, let's say, considering this type of transformation. You need to make sure that your organization, the supply chain policies and the processes are there also aligned. Yeah, so what about your supplier management? Is that ready to, let's say, improve or to change client relations, CRM, etc.? Next to that, also the internal company uh, or organizational attributes needs to be ready. So somehow your, or your organization should be in a state of, let's say, good efficiency 
Also, your internal capabilities around IT and workforces should be ready for such a transformation journey. So don't only start with the technology, also make sure that there is like an organizational fit and an improved structure to, let's say, welcome these kinds of initiatives. And then, of course, everything should then also be measured via an improved performance management. To end up, uh, I would like to give you some key takeaways from uh, projects that we have conducted in the past. So let's say this is, in fact, think before you even, let's say, start the transformation. Of course, it's, uh, you need to make sure that there is a, a, a buy-in from the top management. As we have seen, a lot of companies are still working in silos. There are still, there are a lot of different functions that are involved. So make sure that all of them are part of this initiative. So there should be a global buy-in, or let's say a vertical cross buy-in. So it will not be, let's say, a political topic on your uh, agenda. IT is also a critical path. Um, we already see that a lot of, let's say, companies might have challenges with um, sharing data with the internal system. But then even you should imagine how complex it can be with your external parties like the logistics service providers. So this can take several weeks to months. And even the smaller ones might take longer because they have less IT maturity. Another point there, make sure that the parties that you are now currently working with are that mature in IT and data sharing that indeed they can also facilitate this transformation. So IT is a very important track that you should, let's say, consider internally and externally. Yeah, start with the use case, not the technology. We already covered that. So it's not because a logistics control tower is hot that it would, let's say, resolve your current pain points. So think of the use case, think if it's inbound, internal, outbound, end-to-end, -end, so make sure where exactly, which metrics and which values it should bring. And then potentially a control tower or other types of tools can, let's say, um, benefit um, your, uh, your pain points. Change management, so they're also important because what we see on those kind of platforms there can be more than 1,000 end users, so it's very important that everyone is trained internally, externally, and change management is next to IT, also an important work stream that you should, let's say, um, consider or take into account during your journey. And then there is no immediate return on investment. Uh, it might even get worse <laughs> before it gets better. Uh, that is, of course, because in the beginning you can have some, let's say, some still system bugs, data bugs. Not everyone is using the control tower and, until its full extent. So, first of all, let's say it can get a little bit worse, but in the end you should have the right return on investment uh, that you have calculated or derived from your business case. So, okay. those were our yeah, last key takeaways. Okay, uh, thank you, Marie and Luc, for this very nice introduction to uh, control towers. It looks like there's a lot of potential in it, uh, both from the survey result as from all the, the examples that you gave. Um, yeah, you, you also gave a lot of useful tips uh, for companies that uh, are thinking of going for those digital transformation. But what, what I miss a little bit at this moment personally is some really practical examples of customers, implementations and use cases. Can you also give, give more concrete examples? Um, yes, indeed we can. But what I propose maybe is that we now switch to, uh, to Chris um who will probably uh, also share some use cases because uh, chris is working uh, in a company uh, that is really focusing on, on providing a, a technology platform that is stimulating collaboration between uh, supply chain partners so i, I propose okay that chris takes it forward and I, i'm sure that he will have some interesting cases okay chris the floor is yours thank you let me share my screen. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the uh, 
I think the brilliant introduction. And it's always good to, uh, when you listen to um, the people who really have some um, kind of in-depth analysis, um, I really picked up three things. First of all, when I look at the digital uh, maturity model, which uh, Luke presented, it's, it's all about collaboration. And I think that the three layers, which uh, Marie also um, pointed out, it's, it's really important that you, you understand that it's not just about getting data, is to make sure that you analyze the data and then you actually do something with the data. In order to be able to do something with the data, collaboration is a key element. Um, it's all about seamless. Um, what, what, we, what, what really drives us is that somewhere there starts to become a disconnect between what I would call B2C supply chains or the B2C supply chain experience, as, as Luke mentioned, is the Amazon way of uh, where with two clicks you, you buy a package from the other side of the world. And then when you try to do the same thing in, an, in a B2B environment where you would believe that um, people are actually better equipped, you see that a lot of these uh, processes are still today very painful and very difficult and very laborious. And um, I think there is actually very little that prevents you from getting a what I would call a B2C environment in your B2B uh, growth sphere. And then I think let's not forget about this is that um, we're still humans um, I, I hear that indeed uh, the future is probably self-driven and, and yes I believe there is a level of self-driven which is going to come which is going to slowly come in but today um, the self-driven is for everything which goes fine and I think more and more the human interaction will be on the exception where we say everything which goes fine is going to be self-driven and maybe some easy decisions will be taken for little issues. And I think the value add work will come uh, by linking people for the exceptions. And that's where communication communication is key. Now we at Street Manor, we've, um, we've actually looked at these uh, control towers, which might after the two presentations of Luc and Marie, look for a lot of you people in the business as saying something like whoa this is not for me or definitely not for me today what i want to tell you now is that it's something which is actually for you it is actually something which is today running we have operational customers who've installed um maybe not in the beginning the the the, the control tower with all the functionalities because as um, with them the functionalities will grow but we've built the backbone the backbone is there, it's operational, and it really starts from the pain. Remember, Marie says you don't do a control tower because it's a hot topic. No, you do a control tower because you've got a problem. And what we see is that a lot of the supply chains are actually not supply chains. They're actually more supply atolls, where people are living on the little islands. And in between, there is a, a, a sea with sharks, sharks who eat the data and make sure that the data doesn't cross from one island to the other island. Carriers are trying to look when they can deliver. Suppliers are looking for the latest PO update. The sourcing department wants to know when it's going to be delivered. The warehouse tries to plan whenever where all the work is there. And in the shop, of course, they've got a customer or in the, in the, whatever, in the commercial part, they've got a customer in front of them. And they would just like, love to know when they can actually uh, service that customer. That is still where if you do surveys, a lot of your employees are actually filling their days with trying to find data, and passing data along the chain, or let's call it island hop it from a stakeholder to stakeholder. But that's technologically no longer needed. Because the whole essence is that a control tower is not only, is not only about connecting systems. Yes, you need to connect systems because the systems uh, provide you the data, is making sure that the people who actually have to do something with the data are actually connected and are in real-time connection. And on top of that, once you've created this, this environment where people are connected and people are sharing the same real-time data, you can build on that foundation, you can build automation or at least uh, 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 plugins or apps which streamline your work, which make your work automatic, which actually gets you the productivity improvement. The layer is people and data, and on top you put um, 
these uh, plugins which automate certain functionalities. And that combination gives you the visibility and this management by exception and the speed of implementation. And this is what I'm all talking about is not science fiction. It is a tool which today is running on Amazon Web Services and is used by um, today already 200 companies are running their um, uh, supplier relationship carrier uh, collaboration using Streamliner. So it's really something which is today operational. By the end of the year, we will be based on the contracts which are today already signed. We'll have more than a thousand companies using Streamliner for in their day-to-day -day business. Now, what's the essence of Streamliner? The essence of Streamliner is what we call the community. And you as a receiver, you will unite your suppliers and your carriers in a community. Very important to note is that suppliers who onboard on Streamliner, they can join on Streamliner multiple communities, which is today already the reality with the customers we're having, meaning that they don't need to onboard two, three times on every little portal there and another log in there. And basically they, they are lost by all the, the tools that are well to used. This tool is by nature multi-supplier, multi-community, which makes this uh, management, and uh, as, as Marie pointed out, the training uh, much more uh, easy. We see it now with our customer number uh, three and four. Their onboarding goes much faster because up to 30, 40% of their suppliers are in common with previous uh, customers, meaning there's no training to be done, no invitation to be done. They are already on, on, on the platform. But the essence is the, is the community um, where you actually you choose to share information with the community. I'll show you also the little uh, map in, in the middle because there's also something very interesting which we um, promote through Streamland, which is collaboration. Collaboration, we all need to somewhere work together on saving the planet. Today, what we see is that our customers are seeing on average a 20% reduction in different carriers showing up in, at their doorsteps because naturally by showing your suppliers where their close colleague suppliers or sometimes competitor suppliers are located and the carriers which are already on the network, there's a natural behavior of people to look for collaboration, to look for optimization. So just by putting in Streamland, 20% less carriers for the same volume in front of them. Oh, sorry. So really, um, again, community, sharing data, the productivity comes out of the plugins. Do something with the data. You, you can call it the analytics. It's analytics and, and next step. So it's really all about real time. I think there's really in essence, if you look at the Amazon supply chain, the essence of the Amazon supply chain is it's all in real time. It's not downloads, attachments, which are emails. By definition, if you communicate via email, it is desynchronized in time. The attachments you send is outdated by the moment you've sent it because something has happened in your ERP backbone, which by the time that your supplier or customer or carrier reads it, it's no longer reality. Everything you do today on the Streamline Control Tower is happening in the cloud. And by definition, you're all seeing the same reality. The moment I click, supplier sees it. The moment the carrier does something, the, his customer sees it. So it's really, if you really want to get this, Amazon B2C experience in your supply chain, go to a size environment where actually everything is shared in real time, which is today uh, the case on stream. If you try to position it, the control tower, I think it's also important to understand that a control tower does not replace your operation systems. It is not a competitor of VMS. It is not a competitor of a VMS or an ERP system. It is really a communication collaboration layer and somewhat automation layer as we go into the future. We sometimes call it the slack uh, of the supply chain because what we add by giving this real-time visibility and communication uh, capability, we are making sure that it's, it's the glue between the bricks or uh, the mortar between the stones, making sure that what you do in your WMS, you prepare an order, that your counterpart is aware of uh, during this timestamp that the order has been picked, that the, the transport company has picked it up, that uh, he made an appointment. All these things, he might use a TMS to, to select the cheapest carrier or the best carrier. 
that is something which is in the TMS, but he books the appointment, uh, allocates the, the driver to the shipment, and that is information which is shared with the network. The way he selects his carrier and his rates, that's not something you want to share with your, uh, with your supplier. Is, is that's internal kitchen. So we actually will only share in streamlining the relevant information which can be safely and securely shared across the community, and then the community can look for collaboration with us. So that's really the essence of, of, of the tool. And then there's another element which um, it might look like a side effect, but I think it actually is more important than, than what we think today, is that today, the youngsters, the, the, or even the less youngsters, and they are no longer accepting to do stupid work. And when they actually are at home, and when they organize a little barbecue in their garden, they're not emailing their 10 friends. They're not even calling them. They're creating a little WhatsApp group. And in real time, they're sharing who brings the beer. Uh, it's half an hour later. Uh, yes, I will bring the dessert. Try to organize this by emailing all your friends you're going to see that your mailbox is exploding, whereas in the natural way of this instant messaging, um, it is adopted and it goes actually very smoothly. So what we actually have had added to sharing data and uh, building, uh, let's say, automating um, uh, by certain uh, um, apps, we added an instant messaging. An instant messaging, which actually is between companies, because that's also a key element. Of, once you've got all the telephone numbers and all the email addresses of your counterparts at your hundreds of suppliers, to give you an idea, one of our customers, Macro has got 500 suppliers, and Amarji has got 700 suppliers. By the time you know all those email addresses and telephone numbers, half of them have changed job, a third has left the company. So you are in a permanent chase of trying to keep the, the list up to date. With Streamliner, that role lies with you stakeholders. They will manage their own company. They will manage their own users. And when you instant message with the company, you don't need to know that the customer service person is now this week on holiday. The other one uh, might have gone on uh, and, and taken a different job and is replaced. You are doing instant messaging around the object you want to discuss about, meaning the order. And this actually gives that what people do naturally in their private life, they're also chatting on different things. We want to bring that to your uh, professional world. And remember, once you're going to try to attract and keep good people, you must make sure that the way you make them work is something which they find value added. If they have to start looking for telephone numbers, email, see their email bounce, do downloads which are attached, you're going to lose the good ones. So I think it's also a key element. It's not only that it actually is more efficient. You also see that the adoption rate is really automatic. And you also see it in Streamliner. Once you put Streamliner in place, which the built-in instant messaging, you start seeing that people are using it for different things we didn't even train them for. And that's, I think, the beauty of the adoption is that our customers start inventing applications which we actually never trained them for weeks after, literally weeks after starting with the tool. So instant messaging is, is automatically accepted by, by users once you, you put the tool in there. And I think to make your supply chain an attractive workplace, take this as a, as a side note, it's not only good for efficiency, it's also good for keeping talent. So now we're gonna do the little poll, Jeroen. Do launch it. So the idea is really to to say that you might have thought when Marie and Luc, I think they, they, they give an excellent presentation, but it might have scared you that it's so sophisticated. Whereas we say no, it actually is very powerful. But you can implement it now. But we want to think that like, what are your? Why will you not do it today? It's there. It's available. What's stopping you from from uh, starting tomorrow? It, the poll is launched. Yeah. Um, we're still waiting for people to respond. But uh, Chris, what you say about uh, WhatsApp uh, at the university, we don't use WhatsApp at all. Uh, so maybe to attract some new PhD students next year, I would uh, 
start with uh, a WhatsApp group uh, instant messaging and maybe I'm more attractive for them then. <laughs> I think your content is gonna anyway uh, bring them. Let's wait another few seconds. Yeah, we have nine people that answered this poll. From the last ones, have a go. Okay, let me uh, let me summarize. Um, so we see uh, two reasons is um, resource availability and uh, how to start an approach to implementation as being the two uh, main reasons. Um, and then the other one is really around top management buy-in cost implementation, cost implications and no real business case. Um, yeah, let's, I think um, we will definitely resource availability is, is, is always an issue. And um, we will uh, definitely go into that it's actually not so difficult and uh, we'll come back on the business case also because I think there is indeed a business case. Let me continue. So a nice bridge to the next slide is um, today um, for the control tower, yes, it is a business case. Yes, it is. Um, you, you not only do it for, uh, let's call it, the soft elements of a, of a better, better service. There is a real hard business case. And um, together with, with PwSA, when we launched uh, Streamlander, we really worked on um, helping our customers on saying, yeah, but uh, there's no business case. So we really made a template where we're saying, how can you, as from day one, um, make sure that you get a multiple of your it's not even investment because it's a, it's a it's a rental monthly fee. You get a multiple of your rental monthly fee back, and then the additional availability because we all know that once you implement logistics control towers, the, the suppliers are better monitored, are better engaged with you. Their service level go on. So the uplift on better say, uh, service level and therefore the linked higher sales. We do not take into the uh, into the business case. We say the true business case comes from less waiting times for the trucks. For some uh, companies, this is even the prime reason to start because their suppliers start to really uh, threaten with um, price increases because they make the trucks wait too long. A very important element is fast settlement of, of claims uh, where they can really do it. Operational efficiencies and, and uh, fast settlement of claims and operational efficiencies are really hours where we quantify how many hours are used in your supply chain where people are idle or people are looking for information, people are emailing each other. It is staggering to see how much hours are lost. And then of course, a better visibility. And a last element is CO2 reduction. Um, as I said, by sharing, because what do we do in stream error? We naturally share um, the locations of your different suppliers, um, in, uh, inviting them and motivating them um, to look for um, kind of collaboration opportunities. Today, it is still manual because of course in Streamlander, we haven't built up the database yet, but as um, we are using more and more Streamlander, we're gonna get historical data of the volumes and you don't have to be a genius that in the future, we definitely are uh, on a roadmap, our ideas of having some AI driven suggestions of what could be your potential collaboration partners. But therefore we first need to have data in the, in the tool. So we need to run it some time before these tools will, will, will start working. But today we see already by just visually on a map, showing people where they are located, that our customers saw a 20% reduction of carriers being used and actually more collaborations and, and combinations, which also makes less trucks and more fuller trucks at his, his door. So sometimes um, the easy one also already works. And, and I think you, you can get already a first step and get people motivated by just showing them like, look guys, I'm ordering, you're all located in Spain. Uh, hey guys, I wanna order two half trucks. And that's a real use case of, of, of our customer where he said he wanted to order goods by half trucks instead of full trucks, he just, Told his two suppliers in, um, in the instant messaging saying like, look guys, I want to start ordering by half trucks instead of full trucks. As 
not located in that in that area. Uh, please um, work something out together. And they did. That was as easy as it was to find uh, collaboration and, and money. Um, so it's really this, this kind of easy visual way. And, and of course, you know, technology doesn't stand still. So if I talk to you in one or two years, this is not going to be this because we behind, we are building the database. The tool automatically populates the database. And of course, then automation will kick in as we, as we go further. What we see is really um, uh, logistic control towers is hot, as uh, Marie and Luke pointed out, but we also see indeed the traction. Uh, and the beauty is that by the end of the year, we will have over a thousand companies only in Belgium. Um, and as we we're talking, we are preparing now international rollouts um, because it really shows this, uh, what we call networking effect, meaning companies being on multiple uh, communities, meaning the training element, which Marie pointed out, really goes down because it's really something, to give you an idea, an onboarding of a supplier is a one hour a webinar and it's not even a webinar we give live it's a one hour recorded webinar and we onboarded all, all the suppliers so it is it is that easy and there is a built-in in help functions so it is really start with something you might not have all the, the the goodies and all the functionalities on day one but by building the community you really get a a, a great collaboration which really uh, gets things going quite quickly so for those who are more interested, you will uh, get this shared. We've got like a little demo, which I'm not going to show you here to give you an idea like how user friendly and easy it is. But I think the, the key point before we go into, into the questions is really to say, yes, control towers are extremely powerful. Uh, I think um, Luke and, and Marie explained the, the scope very well. The one thing which I wanted to help is I wanted to get you over this um, as three people, um, uh, responded is I don't know how to start. It is not uh, that sophisticated. There are really very powerful tools um, available which are easy to use uh, as a start and then as you grow you can make it more sophisticated. We um, can get you in five, five, five half days training and you are totally ready to use our, our tool. Your suppliers get a one hour uh, recorded webinar and they onboard. And you get your community, you get the visibility, you, you start saving money, your service goes up, you really have now a direct visibility, collaboration and communication capability, um, which not only makes working of your employees easier, more efficient, there's also a building notification system, which will make you only work on the exceptions, because everything which goes well, there's no need to intervene. We all know that um, by um, bringing this capability to the shop floor, actually for younger employees, it's a key capability which they will look for and which will make you a more attractive employees. And by sharing certain information on locations with suppliers, you can also make a step by making your supply chain a little bit greener. Data shows that after a few months, for a few weeks, there were 20% 20, 20 less carriers showing up doorstep of our users. So it's really, I would almost say it's like a call for action. Don't be overwhelmed by what it can all do. There are ways to really start. And then as you grow, we will unlock more capabilities. Um, and it's a business case which really, you really make it back on as of day one. So here stops my presentation, leaving us some time for question. It's back to you, Jeroen. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, before we go to the questions, because there are some questions in the chat, uh, maybe let me summarize the, these three presentations a little bit. Um, what what I, I, I will remember is that uh, these this logistics control tools are not science fiction. Eh? They're happening today. Uh, it's it's tangible. Uh, we we see already uh, many companies doing it, uh, having nice results, uh, improvements in important KPIs. So I don't think it's uh, a buzzword uh, anymore. Uh, it's no longer a buzzword. Uh, it's happening today. Um, I also noticed yeah. that yeah that um, 
that it's very important to involve people, change management. You have this triangle that Marie showed. I think these are very important things to take into account when doing the digital transformation. So, okay, let us now have a look at the questions. Uh, maybe the first question that uh, was asked in the chat was by Chris Andries, and it's a short question. So I will just, uh, uh, if, if you don't mind, Chris, I will just uh, ask this question to, to our speakers. Do you see a difference in approach between a small and medium enterprises and multinational, multinationals? No, there I think uh, if, if I uh, can give the first shot, uh, what, what we see is that, that multinationals um, have, have moved forward already much more than, than SMEs. And I think that's also driven by the, the fact that they usually also have deeper pockets than SMEs. Um, and potentially also because they have, uh, they have more benefit to gain uh, from, uh, from things like a control tower. It, it's not a, a must to have a control tower. You first need to, to answer that question for yourself. But what will it bring to me? Eh? Where, where are my pain points today? And can a control tower solve those pain points? I think that's the first question you need to ask. Uh, the chances are, of course, in a multinational that, that a control tower will bring more benefit than in a, in a small or medium enterprise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think you're right, and but I think as you said, you know, we're now in the phase that it's no longer a tool which is limited to the multinationals. Yes, they started first, absolutely, um, but now there are tools available which are indeed uh, accessible for smaller uh, supply chains because the the cost is less high, so your business case is 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 earlier. We are definitely not only targeting multinationals. We're very happy to have the multinationals. Uh, but um, mid-sized companies, um, if our, our entry level is if you do something like 20,000 orders a year, you are, um, it's, there's already, already business case. So it's not for the real uh, SME super tiny, 20,000 20, orders is not, you don't need to do uh, 10 billion to get that. So the, with some reasonable turnover, you get that. Okay. Then let's move on to the next questions. And uh, Sven Verstrepen is very active and he, uh, he had three or four questions. So maybe I will hand the floor to Sven and then maybe he can uh, yeah, ask his question and give a little bit more explanation. Uh, Sven? Thank you, uh, Jeroen, and, and uh, hello, everybody. Also, thank you, Chris, for your introduction. Um, it was nice to see how your uh, solution works and also to see how far you got because I have seen some years ago where it started and, and uh, I lost touch a bit, so that's good to see. But I would like to ask a question from the shipper perspective. So let's say a shipper needs to have a, uh, yeah, a, an optimized solution, is looking for a control tower. He will usually need to do, of course, some kind of benchmarking or, or uh, an RFQ process before selecting a provider. And there are many providers, uh, uh, as everybody knows, but who are the, the ones that you typically see coming back in, in the long list or the short list uh, in the last, uh, let's say, one or two years? Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on, on that or maybe PWC? Um, yeah. Luke, go ahead. I can answer. Yeah. Yeah. I think Marie has a, has a good view on that. <laughs> yes, thank you. So it's, of course, it depends a little bit on the, let's say, the scope, uh, because in the beginning, let's say, the first control towers that we have seen on the markets are the big one from, let's say, SAP, Blue Yonder, uh, Kinaxis, et cetera. But what we see now is that there are, let's say, more and more also like startups and a little bit like Chris mentioned that have, let's say, that additional layer, like, like not until like the full extent. And there, of course, you have then Streamliner or supply stack also sometimes. So those are, uh, let's say, now the, the players that are definitely, let's say, in the Benelux or, or gaining, uh, um, yeah importance and also visibility and um I, I i would agree so i think on the one hand you got the saps uh, but that's for um if you got uh, one and a half million uh, dollars in your pockets you can call them um if not um don't call them and um, and what we see is that um there are two elements coming if you have some tms systems who are trying to venture into into the collaboration area and so we see some activities on, on that area, but they, they are mainly designed from the, as you say, from the, the shipper point of view. 
Um, whereas um, what, what Streamliner does is that we are shipper or receiver agnostic. So we, you can actually buy Streamliner uh, from two approaches. It's either I'm the receiver, so I want to actually work on my inbound, or I'm an, uh, that's what we call the, that's the receiver version, or we got more what we call the LSP version, which is also, it's called LSP version, but it can also be used by a company, where actually you are want to do the control tower on your inbound and your outbound. Uh, meaning, the, and, and there we see that uh, TMS solutions, as they are designed from the point of view from the one who sends goods out, they, they are less strong on if you want to create a community when you want to actually work on your inbound. That's where we are really um, on the unique sense. And what you also see is that our communities are by nature multifunctional, meaning in, in, our com in our customers, the buyers are on the community, the planners are on the community, the warehousing people are on the community. And it's very, very difficult for a TMS tool to get those people in, in their communities. They tend to be stuck in the warehouse and the transportation and they never get out of that area. We don't come in via the warehouse, we come in via typically the supply chain, which then invites the buyers, which invites the planners, and the warehouse. And that's, I think, this multifunctional community, which you, of course, will also see at the, the Arribas of this world. Uh, but that's what differentiates us from the, the, the TMS players in this segment. And of course, we are cheaper than Arriba. That's easy. <laughs> Thank you, Chris and uh, Marie, very uh, insightful. And I think, yeah, I, I, my next question was already partially answered. You mentioned that uh, uh, Streamliner can be set up very quickly, even in a matter of days or weeks, where I've seen in the past examples of TMS uh, selections that took over a year or, or even two years. Um, so I assume this is where the, the difference is between these more nimble, yeah. let's say, recent startups and the old uh, uh, players. Uh, so that, that question, I think, is, uh, yeah. is answered for me at least. What's always the key challenge is, um, is to find IT resources, because we have a lot of cases where the business wants it, and then they call us back on saying, I come back within a few years because we don't, or a few months because we don't have IT resources. In our case, we need one interface, which is the open order interface between your ERP systems. The rest, we got a full API layer. The rest, you can interface with the AMS, you can interface with the TMS, but you don't need to do it on day one. So our vision is always, guys, start, Give us the open order file. And then once you're live, we can connect with your kiosk. Uh, uh, we can connect with your TMS, your WMS, whatever you, you want to do. But the fact that you're starting, you start getting games and you avoid this. I need to build five uh, APIs. Uh, I'm gone for six months before I get my first euro savings. So it's really this evolution um, where we say to people, look, we know that the API to get the open order file is two to three days of work for IT. It takes them typically three months to plan those two, three days. That's another discussion. But it's really actually in, in one customer we had in 48 hours, we, were, we had the interface. Because the, the person, the IT manager said, I'm going to do it in 48 hours. It later it was live. But it's more a planning point of view than a resource point of view. And then you live. And then afterwards, you interface whatever. And that's, I think, the beauty of, 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 the, of, the, of the of And it's also where you see every three weeks, we got a new it's an agile development. So every three weeks, we bring new functionality on board, listening to our customers. So it's, I think this is this startup nimble. Yeah, we, we, we're not a pack boat. Huh? We, we don't have a lot of history, so we can really move very quickly, listen to the customers. And, and that's why I always say, like, guys, start. We, we can do, we make the business case, we take a decision, and literally in weeks, we are, we are up and running. Mm. Uh, impressive. Um, just maybe skipping to the last one because I don't want to dominate uh, the conversation. Um, you, you saw in the past that some of the bigger transport uh, control tower providers included also procurement and they could bundle, uh, let's say, the, the volumes of the different uh, clients to, to increase the purchasing power. That is something which uh, Streamliner also does or this is out of your, let's say, uh, service offering? Uh, today, we don't want to compete with TMS. We don't want to compete with WMS. So indeed, these functionalities are for us out of scope today. Okay, uh, yep. um, uh, we're not a TMS. We do not buy it. It's that's something which um, is done in different applications. Okay, that's, that makes sense. And that's clear to me. Yep, thank you very much. Maybe to complement on the, on the previous question, uh, Sven, um, where, where Chris said uh, that's easy to, to set it up. 
Uh, we also have done a similar exercise for uh, a chemical company, uh, which was quite complex. We had to onboard uh, 600 carriers uh, globally. Um, to be honest, it was not, not that easy. I mean, uh, the first 400 were maybe okay yeah, because they were uh, large carriers, large transport providers with, with strong uh, IT skills and, and, and good IT departments. So that went well. But to get the, the tail uh, of the smaller companies also on board, that took a bit more effort and time than we had anticipated, to be honest. So, uh, yeah, so that's I, something I, you, you have to consider. Uh, I recognize it. Did it include also multimodal or, or uh, all modes yeah. of transport or only road carriers? Because yeah. that makes it extra complex then. No, multimodal. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, there was also a question by Kun Bergmans. Maybe Kun, you can uh, ask it yourself if you want. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, so um, I'm recognizing a lot, of course, of what was said uh, today, a lot of uh, struggle uh, to get everybody on board, also with our company. Uh, but I was also last week at Von Mark at a new warehouse in uh, Kortrijk. And they uh, told me, yeah, the biggest challenge, in fact, was to get all suppliers on board uh, because you were uh, you were saying, yeah, it's 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 one hour per supplier. Yeah, I heard uh, a lot of different uh, stories. Uh, it's already complicated to have uh, all the data that you need when you uh, when you buy something like uh, uh, the batch numbers in time before uh, arrival of the goods. And, and then I hear you say that it's quite easy to get those suppliers from Asia, from China, from India, they don't care, in fact. Eh? They say we send everybody everything and then, yeah, the data, uh, it's, it's, it's a real challenge. So uh, maybe in Europe it's easier, but I don't know what is your experience also to get people from outside uh, Europe on board on the, the Streamline plot platform? Uh, uh, today we have users um, mainly in, in Europe today, but we do have users in, in Vietnam. Uh, but I, I think um, you must, I want to make a distinction between what I'm saying is that to get them on board and, and start using it. Of course, the one thing which um, I do not control is the quality of the, the data. data they send. If, of course, uh, we allow them to upload documents um, together with an order, as you say, uh, batch numbers or whatever. Of course, we never look into are they now uploading shit. <laughs> um, that's that's something that that's for the, for the customers. But what we see is that the, by the fact that we offer um, manual uh, UX, so you don't need to automatically go to the API integration. Those small players they will just log on to our SaaS platform and do the manual uh, setup. We don't force them to go through an, an, an IT integration. So if you don't want, want to, if you, because a lot of these companies, they might have like, yeah, look, I got five shipments a year to this customer. Yeah. They understand they don't want to develop an API for those five shipments. Eh? So they will say just, you log on to uh, Streamrunner and you book your five shipments and you upload the documents and life is, life is gone. Eh? And they're happy. I, I, we haven't got any problems by people doing that. So that's sometimes you must offer and not all your suppliers uh, come with 20 trucks a day. Uh, think also of the scale. And, and that's where a lot of these um, uh, big solutions fall over because they believe everybody should do EDI. And then you know, the customers say, well, you're very nice. You send me two orders a year. And implementing EDI costs me 10,000 euros, which is basically three years of my revenue with you. So um, they're not going to do it. No. So in our tool is for free. They go to the system, they log in, and, and they're, they're happy to do that. Yeah, but mainly European customers or, or suppliers are using it. Okay, thanks. We do have two in Vietnam. <laughs> okay. okay, there was also a question by Sven on the revenue model. Maybe because we still have time, you can still ask the question. I, I can do it. The revenue model of, of Streamliner, is it a payment per transaction or fixed B? fee based on the uh, number of users or something else? Or again, so, sharing, that's also something that you sometimes see, yeah. Um, so it's a very good question, um, Sven. And when we build the model, we deliberately did not do it based on users. Because our philosophy is a community uh, is the value of the community, which is the data which is on the community. 
It's a bit like uh, Facebook. The fun of Facebook is, or fun of YouTube is you find stuff on it because otherwise nobody would go there if there's no information. So we say you can invite as many users as you f find fit. We use the number of orders as, as a kind of a transaction driven. So based, uh, we agree a batch of orders. And of course, if you go to a different batch, your monthly fee uh, goes up. So it's like a, a SaaS application. You, you pay a monthly fee. The fee is based by paid by the receiver. So he puts it free of use for his suppliers and carriers. And there's also a very important reason why we do that, because we know that some of the platforms, they do it the other way around. Meaning that if you've got 500 suppliers, instead of having the receiver pay, you make the 500 uh, suppliers pay one euro 50 or two euro per, per shipment. That uh, looks to be cheap, but that's first of all, administratively a nightmare because you've got all those credit cards you need to check. And also it delays your rollout because suddenly you have a negotiation with 500 of your suppliers you have to convince to pay two euros per, per transaction, which anyway, they're going to charge you back. So you believe it's for free for you, but uh, after three months, it's in your price. So our strategy was very well. You are the receiver, you get the benefits. Of course, your carriers and suppliers also get the benefit, but you're the decision maker, you pay for it and you put it for free. Uh, at the use of your suppliers and carriers. And you basically we agree a fixed monthly fee based on an older batch. And every three months we will review. If your orders have increased, we we'll put you in a different price budget. Clear. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I don't see any questions anymore. Maybe I still have a question, but feel free to, to still ask questions in the chat if you want. Or take the take the take the floor. Huh? Uh, maybe one question that I still have. I, I heard the number twenty thousand. So once you have starting from twenty thousand orders per year, uh, a digital transformation and a control tower can be interesting. Would you say that it is a must-have then, or is it a nice to have, or are there other factors besides this this round number that that impacts the decision to go for the transformation? Uh, well, I can answer. Maybe Marie, you also want to add into. Um, I think Marie pointed out. Of course, there must be there must be a pain in in, in somewhere you've identified. It all starts from. You must have a. Uh, you must feel the pain that, yeah, your your service is not there. You you don't run your operations. Uh, um, I think that's that's the important element that you, there is a there is a clear business case. I, I strongly believe that you should not do it because it's hip, uh, because it's a hype. No, you should do it because you're certainly saying, look, my customer service, uh, my operational cost is not good enough. Um, and a lot of people try to optimize within the four walls of their company, but there's a moment when, um, yeah, the, there's a very big opportunity which lies outside the four walls. And if you really make sure you bring those people into, into your, your community, you unlock a, a fantastic opportunity of, of improvement. Um, and that, that should be the start. And then I think, as Marie said, uh, yeah, you must be ready. You must uh, make sure that you, you, your IT, your people, uh, this is a tree, the, the famous triangle, which I find is always extremely relevant. But make sure that you 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 know the pain. And it's always what we ask when we talk to customers: is the pain there? Um, and 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 then yes, you should do it. And it's not so complicated. I really want to tell everybody: is it it's it's not so complicated. If you start with a, um, don't start with everything because then you're going to run a project of two years and nothing will be running. Start and then grow, um, grow into by adding more functionality. Marie? Yes, no, that's exactly how I also wanted to reply. So it's definitely first your pain point to identify what exactly is your use case. And as you have seen, there are per use case and depending on inbound, internal, outbound, there are a lot of value drivers, cost savings, et cetera. And then indeed those kind of things you should incorporate in your overall business case. Eh? So indeed is the cost of a potential tool, how much let's say, will it then um, have an impact on, on the other value drivers? So it's, uh, I don't think 
20k of orders is like uh, yeah an hardcore that like threshold or it's it's definitely there are multiple things to uh, to consider there yeah and then indeed if it's a must have for a nice to have um, depending on on the on the intent <laughs> But I think it's 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 um, what we see is that the, the external uh, supply chain is is an area where still a lot can be done. Because a lot has been done on optimizing your internal, your customer service, your inventory management processes, your warehouse operation processes. A lot has been done in there, and um, but then and we're sometimes really surprised when you when you talk to to companies who got like really very nice supply chains. And then you say, when, you, when are your suppliers coming? I don't know. I don't know. I see them coming. Or sometimes, and then how do they come? Ah, they call somebody or they send an email. I want to come tomorrow. And then, and then who knows that they're coming one week later? Ah, but nobody knows. It's because it's, the, the stock becomes available once it's booked into the ERP system. But it's already a week that you know that the order is going to be late. Yes. Who knows? Nobody. Because actually the buyer or, or even the commercial people will only see that ah, there's an open order. I should have delivered. I didn't deliver yet. Ah, finally it's booked in. I said, guys, this is all data which can be made uh, available and shared um, by just very simple processes. And then you suddenly unlock a whole element where buyers are saying, yeah, but if you told me that he was going to deliver a week late, I could have called him. I could have and, uh, uh, sent him a notification. So this type of very basic things with technology, you can now streamline your organization. And that's where the pain, I think that's, if you've got that pain, then it's time to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, by, by saying this, I think you already answered partially the, the, the last question I see in the, in the chat from Harry von der Burgt. Eh? The question is, what are besides the pain, the preconditions for a control tower, ERP, APS, others? So are there really preconditions? Do you really uh, have to have a, an ERP system before you can start with a control tower? Yes. If I can, I believe this was also, let's say, um, covered in, let's say, the triangle. So you have to see that, let's say, your overall organization processes, policies, but also, let's say, the internal organization capabilities, IT, but also some kind of efficiency level that you have already met um, should also definitely be in place so you indeed you cannot just apply a technology if there is maybe not an organizational fit so those are, those are definitely things that should also be considered prior to do this transformation journey or indeed that can be assessed but it's it's very important that the the, the organization is also mature enough to have those kind of uh, let's say technologies and in yeah, mainly ERP is is yeah, quite often indeed already a pre precondition uh, yeah. to have the data should be stored already somewhere. And what we see is data can come from ERP, TMS, WMS, but ERP is indeed one of the core systems where definitely uh, data is uh, is available. Yeah, I, I think it is ex excellently, Marie. If today your company people are still ordering over the phone something and they don't take time to put it in the ERP system. Yeah, it's not going to work yeah? because so you need to somewhere have a minimal, um, yeah, minimal level where you're saying, okay, if I buy something, there's a purchase order, the purchase order is in the ERP system. If my, if my customer orders something, I enter the order into the ERP system and, and because then we can start planning it. If, if that's all in, a telephone call or an Excel sheet somewhere, and, and no, then, then you then I would say then first to do your ERP sanitizing, and that would be my. I think your big question is: Do we've got an ERP system, and are all my purchase and sales orders in there? If you can say yes on that, that's probably your first uh, your first um, minimal minimal requirements. And, and maybe also to well to to stress again, uh, control tower is is more than a technology tool. Eh? It, it's yeah. really a function in the company. Eh? It's it's also about processes, policies, roles and responsibilities, organization, 
that's all together forming the control tower. It's, it's, it's more than, than software. Mm -hmm. Community building also. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Ah, there is also another question of Hari. Maybe before I go into that question, um, someone also asked if the presentation and the PowerPoint will be shared. I think so. Maybe the, the speakers still have to look if there are not confidential data there, but I think they can uh, share uh, some version of the of the slides and also the the session is recorded you have noticed this so we can also all the participants will be uh, have the opportunity to also have a, a look again at the recorded session eh? but uh, if if uh, all the speakers uh, allow big version to do this, to share this with the with the participants but then maybe this this question of hardy um can i say RP, uh, the uh, warehouse management system is descriptive layer, while APS is predictive, control tower is corrective. Uh, I would tend to disagree, to be honest. Uh, I, I think a control tower, in the end, uh, as I mentioned in my slides, uh, we, the vision is we talk about a connected and self orchestrated supply chain. And so, self orchestrated means that uh, you can you can uh, do it more as hands-free, um, which means that there also must be intelligence in the control tower, right, ultimately. Um, so there, I think it's also about uh, collecting data, but then processing data and then taking decisions based on those data. So so it's, it's not only looking back, it's also looking forward uh, from my perspective. Yeah, I think by definition, I think, as you say, it is key, it is looking forward. Huh? Um, and, and what you will see, and it's also our internal roadmap, is that uh, now the, the internal logic, it, it's based on uh, timestamps and notifications, so, so we will alert things which might go wrong in the future, and that will develop in the future. There will be more intelligent AI-driven engines as, as we go on, which will make that identifying problems more sophisticated as time goes on. And that's, I think, where you will see the, the natural evolution of those tools is to have more sophisticated uh, exception management and, and, and uh, uh, let's say, decision support. Where I still believe that for a very long time, whenever something goes wrong, the human will have to, to intervene. Uh, for little problems, you will have automation. But when there's big uh, checks and balances to be made, specifically where humans will have to intervene and it's our, our the value is going to be that you are more and more filtering on saying now guys this is something you have to look at this is something where it's not just a little detail can i come an hour later that's probably what the tool will automatically reschedule uh, because we're now talking um, on the roadmap like elements like if a truck is is late based on his gps data we will automatically rebook in the, the first earliest available slot so these things are going to come as, as we talk in the future but the question is that if a supplier announces I'm going to be a week late, yeah, then the tool is going to say, look, guys, now you need to talk, huh? because uh, this looks to be very long. And that's where I think, so this whole escalation of, um, that's where I think the value comes in. So that people will actually do value added work. They will be intervened, not can I come two hours later? No, they will come in and say, okay, do I still need it? What are we going to do? Can we split the order? And that's, of course, I think for, for a very long time, that's where our planners will still be involved in that. Okay, thank you. I think we are at the end of the webinar now. Thank you very much, participants, and thank you very much, speakers. Eh? These were very uh, nice presentations. I learned a lot. Uh, uh, so I'm really grateful for this. Uh, Look, Marie, uh, Chris, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to meeting you somewhere in the future again, hopefully in real life. Eh? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jeroen. Thank you, Jeroen. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye bye, everyone.